Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Cultured Community Podcast slash YouTube channel. I am so happy you're here. I hope you're having a great day, whatever day it is, whenever you're looking at this video. So it's just me today, Asha, because I have some things I want to say to you all. Boo. Hey, Asha from the future here. So listen, this video got way longer than I ever intended for it to get. So I added a lot of timestamps down in the bar for the video. And you can find the timestamps also in the description of the video. So you can click through. You know, it's a lot of different topics in this video. I really meant for it to be more simplified. I am so sorry. I can be long-winded. I'm learning how to do this. This is, you know, new for us. Also, I recorded all of my video in a software called Prezi because it allowed me to pull up the different video clips and text across the screen. But as you can see, this video of me now is a higher quality than a lot of the rest of what you'll be watching for two hours. And that's because I used the web version for the entire video. So the quality, the definition was going in and out. And then I discovered that I can download it to my desktop and get consistent high quality video, but it's too late. I'm not re-recording that, I'm so sorry. I'll do it next time, okay? But, um, you know, this is how the video will look in the future. All right, thank y'all so much for watching and I'll let you get back to the video. So if you are new to our content, if you're new to this channel, me and Nikita talk all things cults and narcissism. Basically because we have been victims of both, both types of abuse, spiritual abuse from a cult and narcissistic abuse throughout our childhood. And honestly, these two things go together hand in hand. They really do. So that was the reason, one of the biggest reasons we were very susceptible to the cult that we were a part of. By the way, again, if you're new, the cult we were a part of is ICOC or the International Churches of Christ. If you have been a part of any cult, I'm pretty sure that our content will relate to you as well. And that's what we're here for, to be a community, because we know that leaving a cult or a lot of times a narcissistic relationship can be a very, very lonely place. And we're here to let you know that you're not alone. You're not crazy. Something happened to you and you deserve to be heard. You deserve to be validated. Which brings me to the topic of this video. We'll be talking about why people stay in cults. Why don't they leave? Why did they stay so long? What in the world were you doing there? There's a door, just walk out of it, right? So we're here to talk about that. And so before I get into it, I want to put a definition up on the screen about what a cult is, okay? And before I read this definition, this definition is from Dr. Yanya Lalich. Now, this is a woman that I have been completely fangirling for the past few weeks. She is a victim of cultic abuse herself, and she's a doctor of sociology and a cult expert who has written lots of books, specifically a new one called Bounded Choice, which is just recently come out, and it's perfect timing for even everything we want to talk about here. Because um, this is something that actually elongates the abuse of cult survivors are questions like, what was wrong with you? Why didn't you leave? The fact that people don't understand the loneliness of trying to heal from this type of abuse. And she has completely become a hero of mine in publishing these books. She has a website, social media accounts, again, Dr. Yanya Lalich. And um, 
Let's just get into her definition. I'm so grateful to have found her. And I think that her resources, I have been devouring her resources. I think they'll be very, very helpful for anyone who's trying to recover or understand what happened to them. With that being said, I mentioned earlier that we talk also narcissism. Another person I'm completely obsessed with, another hero of mine, is Dr. Romney. She has over a million you know, subscribers on YouTube, hundreds of thousands all over social media. She is the GOAT when it comes to narcissistic abuse. Her content has helped me so much even understanding that experience and how it has affected me. And these two, Dr. Romani and Dr. Lalish got together and did a podcast together. Yes, they did. So I'm, as you can see, I'm very excited. I'm trying to contain my excitement. You can't see it, but I just got goosebumps singing it out loud to you. Um, Because for these two to get together, these two powerhouses of information, just gurus of the brain, of psychological manipulation coming together to give us their knowledge and set people free from this type of manipulation. It is the equivalent for someone like me, (laughs) for someone like me, it is like Beyonce and Adele came together to perform a concert. That's what it's like, okay? It is. And of course, I have clips. You're wondering if I have clips? Of course, I have clips of this amazing podcast, YouTube episode they did together. Oh, y'all gonna get that information. Okay, so let's begin with the definition of a cult. According to Dr. Lalich, a cult is a group or movement held together by a shared commitment to a charismatic leader or ideology. It has a belief system that has the answers to all of life's questions and offers a special solution to be gained only by following its rules. It requires a high level of commitment from at least some of the members. Okay. And if you know anything about the International Churches of Christ, It's not some of the members, it's all of them. A high level of commitment from all of them jokers, okay? According to Dr. Lalich, there are four dimensions to a cultic group that we see across the board. The first thing is a charismatic leader, someone with a strong personality and presence. They have charm and persuasion and confidence. They speak with eloquence, and sometimes they have a sense of mystique or magnetism to them. They use their charisma to manipulate and control their followers, and they often present themselves as special or chosen in some way. So if you are a part of ICOC, you know exactly who that is, okay? Kit McCain. (laughs) who now broke away from ICOC and started a whole other movement called the ICC. Now, what happened was his charisma got a little bit too out of control for ICOC, for his top dogs, his board members. They kind of made him take a sabbatical and told him he needs to calm down, you know? And he was like, forget this. I'm going to start a whole nother group. And I'm going to say that y'all aren't actually true believers. And so that's what he did. But to me, they're still the same thing. Kit McKean's ideology, right? That word ideology, you saw that in the definition, still lives on in the ICOC to this day. It's like it'll never die. It's like the people at the very top of this organization still know how to wield his tactics, his system to keep the same level of control that he had. So that brings me to something else. You may be wondering like why Nikita and I don't really talk about the ICC. Well, I'm not a part of it, number one. (laughs) Number two, to me, they're the same thing. And I think, and this is just my opinion, I actually think it's way more important to discuss ICOC and what they do because they are really, really good at having more tact and being more sneaky and appearing 
more genuine and sincere than ICC does. Like, ICC is just very overt with what they do and what they say. I mean, it's no hiding it. I don't I don't even know what to say to people who are part of ICC. What I'm going to say in the video, like, look at this clip. There it is. And I don't want to minimize the members of that cult because they're under the same system and um, tactics that keep you stuck in circular logic that ICOC is. Um, so maybe it's not that I think it's too obvious. Maybe it's just triggering for me. It's triggering because I was just thinking of a, a clip that was shared from a service at ICC where trigger warning, trigger warning. Um, this guy who's an evangelist there pretty much said that a young woman experienced being essayed because she left the church and was no longer following God. And I just thought, that's crazy. He done lost his damn mind. And why are people still there? However, right after thinking that, I immediately dissociated because I remember someone saying something very similar in ICOC. But of course, it wasn't in a lesson. It was behind closed doors. And it didn't sound as cruel. It was more like, yes, we're sorry that this happened to this person, but she wasn't, she was out in the world. She wasn't within the protection of the kingdom of God. And I was like, yeah, it's the same. It's the same crap, just a different delivery, which I think makes them way more dangerous. So anyway, let's move on to the second thing that is part of a cultic group, and that is a transcendent belief system. This is where this group has a sacred wisdom. This sacred wisdom offers a total explanation of the past, present, the future, and obviously, right, it includes a path or the path to salvation. And the most important thing about this is that this leader or this group, they have a special recipe for this transformation, this transcendent transformation that you're being promised, of course, they have the special recipe. Now, when it comes to ICOC and ICC, it's kind of, this is where they are dangerous. And um, it's harder to really see what they're doing because they actually do, do use the Bible. This is a church that says, we're just a church. We follow Christ. We're the church of Christ. Like it's literally in the name. I don't know what y'all are talking about. We just following Jesus up in this piece. Like why y'all have an issue? It's right there in the scriptures. It's right there in the Bible. But what you don't pick up on is that, yes, they're using the Bible, but they're using it in a very specific way. They are constructing the scriptures in a consecutive manner to say, Yes, this is the Bible. There's Christians everywhere all around us, but only we actually follow it the way it's supposed to be followed. Only we put the puzzle piece together. We actually put the puzzle piece together. The secret recipe. And that's why so many people out here calling themselves Christians, but you don't really see the power of God in their lives because they don't have the recipe like we have. And we just have to help people to see the truth. We just got to, you know, the scales, like with Paul, the scales had to fall from his eyes when Jesus came to him and, and let him know that he thought he was following God, but he just really wasn't. And that's all we do. We have the recipe for transformation up in this piece. And so that's how that works, a transcendent belief system. All right. And so the next thing you have to have is a system of control. 
This is another one of, this is the third dimension of the four dimensions of occultic group. And a system of control is a regulatory system that guides the operation of the group. In this group, you have overt rules, regulations, and procedures that guide and control a member's behavior. And in ICOC, they will say that this is the Bible, but we're going to look and see that it's so much more than that. It's so much more than that. It's really the way the Bible is used to indoctrinate a person. We have the Bible, but things are taken a certain way to indoctrinate you into a way of thinking that this specific group wants you to adopt, to put you where they want to put you, to make you your behaviors match the behaviors that benefit them for their agenda, in my opinion. Okay. So <laughs> the fourth thing, and this is such a huge thing with ICOC, is a system of influence. So the systems of influence are the interactions and social influence of the group itself, the human interaction and the group culture. This has a huge effect on how members of a cult learn to develop their thoughts and attitudes and their behaviors. You learn what's good and what's not good in this group, what is acceptable and what is not. And remember how I said that in ICOC, that high level of commitment is required from everybody, from everybody. And it's actually really genius because one of their really strong suits that keeps people stuck in a state of delusion is that everybody around you appears to be adhering with no problem to the rules and the dogma and the behaviors that are required by the leadership. And you just want to go along with it as well. Group think is such a powerful tool. It is so powerful. Anyway, so the interactions of not even the leaders, but the rank and file members is a system. And here's an example of how that works. So let's just say that it's, it's Wednesday. I'm at a midweek service at church and they have this session called Good News, Sh Good News Sharing. And during good news sharing, I share that I have this amazing opportunity for a career, my dream career that I've wanted ever since I was a child, but it's located 3,000 miles away. But it's so good for me and my family because we will be able to pay off debt. We will be able to finally set our kids up for success in a good neighborhood and a good school system. And it's everything we've been praying for. You might actually hear something like this after you finish sharing that to the group. However, if I share that, as a matter of fact, I'm quitting my job and I'm letting go of my aspirations of furthering my education because I want to sell all my possessions and dedicate myself 100% to this organization, making sure that I spread the message of how amazing this place is and bring as many people as humanly possible into this building with these people because this is where everyone needs to be. You might hear this. Wow. Amen. Come on, Come on, sis. Amen. Such an Amen. Praise, Praise God. 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 That's so encouraging. Yeah, that is a system of influence. That is a system of influence. It could be that you say, hey, sis or, or bro, because that's what we have to call each other, right? We're a family. We're a family. I was a little bit uneasy about some of the things I heard at leaders meeting. 
I'm not comfortable with some of the things we were directed to do and say to the people who are part of our small groups. You know, I just don't know that I should be pushing people to perform. People have families, they have kids, they have busy lives. And I just really think that everybody is doing their best. And this really makes me feel uncomfortable. What was said about these people that we're supposed to love the system of influence says, mm, yeah, I, I feel kind of the same way about that. But at the end of the day, you know, the gospel does has, have to be spread. And, you know, we need to be a unified front. We do need to stay unified for this bigger mission. We're supposed to focus on things above. And maybe people just need to reevaluate some of those things they're doing that are making them so tired and making them so exhausted to where they can't continue staying true to their good confession. And you're like, oh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and I just really think that, you know, leaders, yes, he or she came across a little aggressive. But, you know, the leaders, they just have so much on their shoulders. You know, they have been tasked with getting us all to heaven. That's a big deal. So I, I just think that that's, that's what's going on. You're like, oh, uh, yeah, yeah, of course. Of course. You might have just heard them wrong. I think I did. Okay. Okay. I mean, now that you have, you know, helped me to see what was really happening in that meeting, I'm, I'm, I'm more calm now. System of influence. Okay. So now we know what a cult is. You know a little bit of mine and Nikita's background. And, you know, the four dimensions to a cultic group that we see across the board. So now let's talk about the topic of our video. Why do people stay in cults? Why do they stay so long? What's so hard about leaving a cult? This is something that's really hard for people to understand. It's extremely difficult. People say things like, why did you stay so long? Nobody held you captive there. There was a door you could have walked right out of it. You looked happy to me. And there is one statement that I think can be the most damaging of them all. And it is this one. No one put a gun to your head. No one put a gun to your head. Why do I think this statement is so damaging? I think it's damaging because it really minimizes what actually happened to a person. Well, the first thing that happens to this victim of cultic abuse is as soon as they hear a statement like this, they immediately feel immense shame, guilt, and they may want to dissociate. Because they, when you really take a step back without understanding what's been done to you, it does seem really foolish when you consider the gravity of someone pointing a literal gun to your head. And what this person is saying is that your choice to leave the cult wasn't life-threatening. <laughs> it wasn't life-threatening, so why are you so upset? Why was it so difficult? Obviously, you're exaggerating because the only time someone stays in a situation that's so unpleasant like you suggest it is, is because it's life-threatening, which this isn't. They're saying to this victim that you had to have chosen this. You must have chosen this. I mean, so you just don't have a right to talk. You don't even really have a right to be upset. Just move on and be happy. It was just something that worked for you and now it doesn't. It's really that simple. It was not a matter of life or death. But what if I told you that there are multiple studies that suggest otherwise? Studies that suggest that psychological manipulation feels absolutely life-threatening. It is an absolutely life-threatening condition for the person experiencing it. And more than that, cults specifically are really good at creating a pervasive atmosphere of fear, uncertainty, and dependency where 
conformity to the group's beliefs and practices is presented as the only means of survival. Without this group, I won't survive. There is a form of control this group has where there is some type of consequence that is horrifying to the person who wants to leave. The manipulation in cults makes conformity feel like a life or death situation. This has been well studied and we will talk about it. So the manipulation makes conformity feel like a life or death situation causing individuals to prioritize group loyalty and obedience above their own autonomy and well-being. Cults also, and I learned this one from my therapist, that cults leverage Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And we'll see how they do that going forward. And I know what you may be thinking. You're like, okay, these are just some statements you said, but... I mean, how does how does ICOC do this? How does my cult do this? Well, let's talk about it. One of the biggest ways that cults do this is with a us versus them mentality. Cults do such a good job of portraying the outside world as dangerous, corrupt, or hostile. They set up the group as the only source of safety, salvation, and enlightenment. Conformity to the group's beliefs and practices are essential for survival, as I mentioned before. They love to instill a sense of urgency and fear among the members to make them prioritize their cohesion with the group above everything else right? We're here to save the world. We don't have much time. Jesus is coming back, <laughs> right? You, we've all heard those type of things in ICOC. And, and this is so effective because when you believe the secret recipe for salvation or transcendence, you're filled with gratitude, right? You're filled with gratitude, the reason this works is because of the love bombing and the relief of you feeling like you have the answer to everything now. Specifically in ICOC, this is where that us versus them starts. It starts with, here's the truth. You have nothing to fear anymore. You are saved and you're so grateful. You're so grateful. And then they tell you things like, you're now part of God's kingdom. Now. You're part of God's family. You're like, I'm finally part of God's family. I'm in the kingdom of God. What an honor. And because they have this secret recipe for this, you know, as someone who has studied their doctrine, that before this moment, where you go through all of the qualifications to be considered a part of God's kingdom, you know that before that moment, you were not. In ICOC, you have to accept that before studying the Bible with them, before accepting the way they teach the Bible and going through their specific rituals, you have to accept that you were not a part of God's kingdom. You were not a part of God's family. Before this moment, you were in a world of darkness. You were an enemy of God. But now, and only now, you're the light. Right? You're the light. You're leaving behind the darkness. The darkness is behind you. And now you have the truth. Do y'all see it happening? Do y'all see the us versus them taking form, taking flight? There was the you before, and there is the you now. All right, so now I am going to, I guess, issue another trigger warning because I'm going to start pulling up some of the scriptures that are used to further solidify this us versus them scenario, this us versus them system. 
And so why do I offer a trigger warning for scripture as well for those people who have experienced religious or spiritual manipulation and abuse? The scriptures can actually cause them to feel very uncomfortable, remind them of traumatic experiences, and cause an overall feeling of being triggered in their bodies because that's where trauma lives. It lives inside the bodies. So as I mentioned before, you're now a part of God king, of God's kingdom. You are now a part of God's family. You are now a part of God's body. You are now in the light. You are no longer in the darkness. So what's the opposite of these things? <laughs> well, light, the opposite is darkness, right? We do know that. But if you're now in this one setting, what does that mean for everything you left behind? If you're now in God's kingdom, if this is God's kingdom, then what is that called? Let's look at one of the scriptures that is often used in this particular cult. John 15, 18 through 25. If the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. This is Jesus speaking. If you belonged to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. This is why the world hates you. Remember what I told you, a servant is not greater than his master, and I'm your new master, Jesus, right? So if they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. If they obeyed my teaching, they will obey yours also. But they aren't, are they? They aren't doing that at all. So you're in God's kingdom. So what you were a part of was the world. And what did Jesus just say about the world? It hates you. It is not aligned with Jesus whatsoever. As a matter of fact, you've been chosen out of it. And I know what some of you may be thinking. You may be thinking, well, that's just what the scripture says. What you want them to do about that, Asha? Well, that's where the indoctrination comes in. Because it is ICOC's doing of suggesting that the kingdom is only here. This is the kingdom. This sacred transcendent knowledge that we've given you puts you into the kingdom. They continuously refer to themselves as the kingdom. So anything that's not inside of this place is the world and it hates you. It wants to persecute you. You've been chosen out of it. You are set apart. It hates you, <laughs> you know? So you're like, whoa. They're like, people aren't gonna understand what you've done, this decision, this choice you've made to be with us, the kingdom. So it's not that I'm refuting that the scripture says this. What I'm pointing out is the fact that what the scripture doesn't say is that the kingdom is only in ICOC. And ICOC is so clever because they're like, because some of you are probably watching and saying, well, we don't say that. We don't say we're only the kingdom. Yes, you will never say those words specifically. Well, in the past you did actually. <laughs> in the past you said it all the time. Now you're just a little bit more clever because Kip is over there. Kip, Kip got his new group and they will, they will literally say it. They will literally say nobody Christians but us. <laughs> and, and that's what you used to say. Now you're just more clever with it. You don't officially say we're the only kingdom of God, but you do say my kingdom friends and my worldly friends. You say that. <laughs> you call your job your secular job. It is not a kingdom job, right? When you refer to any relationship, any romantic relationship, you refer to the ones you have inside the church as a kingdom relationship. And that boyfriend, before being a member of the church, he was my relationship, my boyfriend in the world. 
You talk like that. You talk like that. So you are saying it. I have never heard, and you will never call someone, a friend of yours who's a member of another church, you will never call them your kingdom sister. You don't do that. And you need to ask yourself why. If you really are under a delusion and you're not just lying to yourself, you need to ask yourself why. Okay. Okay. Moving on. I can move on. All right. <laughs> This scripture says, do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. Love for the Father isn't even in you. When you love the world, you can't even have a relationship with God. So now this us versus them is even stronger. You have to cleave even tighter tighter to this group because if you don't if your relationships if you have closer relationships more significant relationships in the world you're a lover of the world and you see what the scripture says hunty it says the love of the father is not in you and again this is only an issue in a cult because they are the ones who have labeled themselves as the kingdom so if you are sitting back saying to yourself, why didn't I leave? They said I didn't have a gun to my head. I didn't have a gun to my head. No, you didn't. But you believed that the love of the Father would not be in you if you didn't stay within this group. You were handed a very strong and powerful us versus them system. All right, let's look at another one. Colossians 1, 13 and 14, for he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. You have been rescued. You have been rescued because out there before you entered the kingdom, the kingdom, You were in darkness. You had no redemption. You had no forgiveness of sins. That forgiveness of sins, that redemption is found here. There's here, the kingdom, and there's before here, not the kingdom. What was before here was darkness. We got you to agree to this secret recipe of salvation. No one else taught you this. Therefore, anyone you know who doesn't believe in this secret recipe is in darkness. Let's 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 take that. Let's take that a little further. 2 Corinthians 6:14. Do not be yoked together with unbelievers for what do righteousness and wickedness have in common or what fellowship can light have with darkness? If you are feeling really uneasy right now, I just hope you do. If you have decided to stay with me as we read through these scriptures and you're squirming, good, feel it, feel what happened to you. What do you feel when you see these scriptures? If you're honest, you know that these are the scriptures that convinced you that you had to pull yourself away from all of your friends and ties outside of this organization. You cannot be yoked with them. We have given you the secret recipe. You believed the secret recipe. If you understand, you fully understand what God really wants from you, you understand that before we taught you what we taught you, you were in the darkness and now you are in the light. You have nothing in common with those people before this moment. You don't have anything in common with them anymore. Your light, their darkness us versus them system on lock. And this is this is the only area where I'm going to show all these scriptures cuz I have some other things to show you um regarding how specifically cults set things up to make you to make leaving them a life or death situation, but I honestly think that this one area 
of the us versus them system, dude, we could stop here. Because ICOC, they, this is their chef's kiss. This is their creme de la creme. I mean, this is the one they, they got. They get you with this one. You will rationalize anything because deep down inside, this is where they really have instilled that fear in their true believers. That there's nowhere we can go. There's nowhere we can go. All right, let's look at the next one. Colossians 1, 18. And he, meaning Jesus, is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead so that everything he might, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. He is the head of the body, which is the church. The body of Jesus is the church. He's the head. You the body. Jesus is the head. So we're the church. We're the kingdom. We're Jesus's literal body. So how do you think you're going to be connected to Jesus if you're not a part of the body? So now leaving this church literally means no connection to Jesus anymore. And you want to sit here and tell me, you want to sit here and tell me that it wasn't a life or death decision. Why didn't you just leave? Why didn't you just leave? Indoctrination is how. Your life, your literal spiritual life, eternal damnation was on the line. Jesus is the head. This church, the true kingdom, is the body. You're severed. The head is severed from you. (sighs) Let's look at another one, guys. Two more. Two more, I promise. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 12 through 13, and then we'll jump down to verse 21. Just as a body, the one, has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. So it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit, so as to form one body. Oh, they love that number one, baby. Down in verse 21, the eye, right? Because the eye is a part of the body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. Oh, you need us. You, the, listen, listen, you have bought into our recipe. You are now in the kingdom. You are now a part of this church. We are one body. There is only one body. Where do you think it is? (laughs) It's with us because we were the only ones who really taught you this truth. And you can't say you don't need us. None of us can do it alone. There is no Lone Ranger. There's no Lone Ranger. We have to do this in community. It's only a body, the church, that is connected to Jesus. And we're the church. Again, these scriptures say this. Hear me out. These scriptures do say this. But it is ICOC who created this secret formula that only the small group has conformed to. And so they have made, they have defined what the kingdom is, what the church is. And so then you see the scripture that tells you, you have to be connected to these people no matter what. Or you will have no relationship with God. And you want to tell me that it was not a life or death situation. Get get out of here. Get out of here. Okay, and now the last one. We made it, guys. It's the last scripture. Ephesians 4, verse 4 through 6. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. 
So it is right here that you are fully indoctrinated with the idea that there is only one true body. There's only one true body. Why? Because there's only one true faith. And we've taught that to you. We taught you the one truth. We have given you the keys to the one faith. There can't be many. There can't be various different ones. Everybody who truly follows God truly follows the truth that we have taught you. This is what you were called to. This is your one hope. You know, it's just so funny because I remember <laughs> we would talk about this, right, as the community. I remember talking about this with some members. It's kind of like, yeah, this church it has a lot of issues. There's a lot of stuff that goes on that, you know, I don't necessarily agree with. But me and this particular group of friends used to always quote John 6, right? Verse 66 to 68, where it says, now what happens is Jesus just told people that if you want to come after me, you have to eat my body and drink my blood, referring to communion. And it said at that moment, in verse 66, from this time, many of his disciples, the people who followed him, turned back and no longer followed him because they were like, I don't know about that. <laughs> Drink your blood, eat your body, you know? And so then Jesus turns to the 12, you know, and says, you do not want to leave too, do you? Jesus asked the 12. And Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And we used to literally say that just to help you to understand the indoctrination of people in ICOC. The, and this can go for any cult. I guarantee you that people of any cult have the same level of indoctrination. We felt the same way as members. We felt like at the end of the day, this is the place that taught me the truth. They're the ones who taught me the words of eternal life. So where... Where would I even go? Where would I even go? And that is that is sad. That is sad. But that is the corner that people are backed into as members of this church. Where would I even go? So you want to tell me that the door is right there? Just go. We've been indoctrinated. We've been indoctrinated, okay? So leaving this place is literally the difference between light or darkness. Being with or without Christ. Being in the kingdom or being in the world, which we know the world hates Christ. And he called you out of it. And you can't love the world and love him. You just, it, they don't match. It's literally the difference between heaven or hell. Being part of this church is literally the difference between heaven or hell. So it is the spiritual, metaphorical life or death situation that is very real. That is very real to members. And like I told you, my Beyonce and my Adele are coming up with clips to help y'all understand this a little further, if you're still confused. Light or darkness, with or without Christ, kingdom or world, heaven or hell, is literally life or death. So that's why we talk about it. That's why we're speaking about this. Because these people, like me, we were literally trapped. It's not okay. The impact of that place will follow us forever. And if you were someone who's like, just move on, you know what? One of the things it makes me think is that you're a person, because this happens in all cults, there are people who benefit from it. There are people who are benefactors of the system. It tells me that you're probably someone who benefited from it. You're someone who has a lot of moral in injury from what you did to people, and you are upset. It it really harms or irritates your demons to hear people talk about this. You want to believe. You want to believe that it was an easy situation of just walking out the door to ease your conscience, and it's not. 
And if you are someone who's been shamed and blamed and belittled, I want you to know that you are not crazy. You are not alone. This is your truth and you are valid in every single emotion or feeling that you have. And like I said, there will be some clips that we'll look at to help with this some more. So that was just the first thing, the first way that cults, you know, create this environment of conformity as the only means of survival. That was just the one way of how cults make conformity a literal means of survival, the us versus them mentality. But like I said, I had to go in on that one because ICOC, they they got that one on lock. That's the one that'll keep you no matter what. <laughs> That's the one. I mean, toward the end, before I left, it was just me and a, a bunch of friends and, and we just kept, we couldn't, we couldn't ignore what we were seeing anymore. But the one thing we would keep saying is we, we got to stay unified. We got to, the God is faithful, the body of Christ, the body. I mean, it was that one last piece that had to break for us to be free. And it was not easy. Okay. So that was just the one, one <laughs> of the ways that cults create this environment where conformity is literally survival. Um, Another way they do this is with threats of punishment or excommunication. So members are often warned that deviating from the teachings or disobeying the leader's request will result in dire consequences. This could include being expelled from the group, which we know feels like a death sentence to people. We just talked about that. It can mean loss of your salvation. Oh, they dangle that salvation over your head the entire time you're in the organization. Spiritual damnation, which is the same thing as loss of salvation. And these threats compel members to comply with the group's demands to avoid the perceived harm. You think you're just joining the kingdom of God and you're just going to have all these great friends and you're just going to have fun. And little do you know that there are going to be things that are required of you. And if you say, oh, I don't know about that, you're going to be met with, hmm, but you said Jesus was Lord. I mean, I did. What does that have to do with what you're saying right now? Wait. Am am I disobeying Jesus? Well, I'm just saying you won't be doing well spiritually. Well, not doing well spiritually means I'm in threat of hell. Oh, that says she's struggling. What is struggling? I don't I don't want to be defined as struggling. I want to be known as a person who's a strong Christian who loves God. That's why I joined this place. How do I how, how do I get out of the struggling list? And don't even get me started on the ways that this organization would literally publicly shame people and expel them from the church when their behaviors didn't match what they wanted it to match. The numbers of people being disfellowshipped who had to face this public humiliation, the way they were broken. And this only happened to some people. I was stupid enough to think that it was happening to everyone who honestly, sincerely, you know, just wasn't repenting and doing what the Bible says. No, it was only certain people. Other people, right, depends on your relationship to the top leadership. It depended on what you were providing to this organization, what gifts you had to provide to this organization. Oh, their stuff would just be covered over. Covered over. Heinous things covered over. I mean, you all know. I'm going to put links to this stuff in the um, description below the video as well. There are tons of articles about this organization. There's lawsuits going on right now because of heinous things that happened to people by top leadership that was covered up because it didn't benefit the organization. 
These threats of punishment were only for, you know, lower level people, the good people, you know, the ones bringing in the money, putting in their hard work, making sure that the rest of us lived in this constant state of fear, making sure that we got to work to make sure we were never in the same position as that person who just got excommunicated. Then there is isolation and dependency. So we just talked about the us versus them, but what comes along with the us versus them system is that members are isolated from external sources of support, information, and validation. And when you live in this constant system of us versus them, you become dependent on the group. This group is now your entire social connection. This is the, these are the only people where you're allowed to receive emotional validation. And so if you don't fall in line, if you're not conforming, if you leave, you are literally abandoning your whole social support system. And this prospect of losing the only community that you have because you've had to separate from everyone else. So when you lose this only community that you have, right? Because belonging is a part of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? That's a, a human need for survival. When you lose that community, it feels like a life-threatening situation. And you're motivated to keep that community because it is a means of survival. This place made sure that you cut off everybody else. Yeah, they made sure that they're the only community you actually have. So you must comply or you're out there alone in the dangerous, awful, terrible world that is an enemy to God that hates you. Dissociation moment. Okay, and we are back from that dissociation break. The next thing on our list is that they control, they have control over information and communication. So I, I need to tell y'all, okay, okay. No, we won't look at any more scriptures, but I told you I have some amazing clips for y'all from Dr. Romney and Dr. Lalich, but I also have clips demonstrating some of these things I'm talking about from sermons recorded at ICOC. So there, there may be another trigger warning coming up if you're not ready to hear the voices or see the faces of some of these people, you know, preaching and teaching these harmful things. So just a quick warning. What I was saying is that cults control the flow of information and communication within the group. So even within the group, there are only certain things you're allowed to talk about. And they do a very great job in ICOC particularly, particularly with small groups called discipling groups or discipling trees, where you have a small group leader and different people connect from top down, a hierarchy, right? To see what's going on. And you're constantly reporting back up to the top of the tree. And this, in this way, they're easily able to control information that is shared even within the group. So let's not even talk about how you're cut off from communications outside of the group. You're cut off from communication even inside of the group. And ultimately, you're cut off from information inside your own brain. That is a whole nother topic, okay? Um, but they can censor any dissenting viewpoints, right? Um, this, these tactics, they are very effective at limiting your ability to critically think, 
critically think, step outside of your point of view and look at what you've been taught. Evaluate it critically. You can't do that when someone is controlling the flow of information. You're not able to question the teaching, the teachings, question the leader's authority, seek an alternative perspective. So the only thing that that is happening is that the narrative you've been fed is the one that keeps being reinforced, which leads back to conformity, conformity to the group's beliefs. To stay safe, to be protected, and to survive. You don't even have, you don't even have any other points of view. You don't even have any other points of view. How are you supposed to leave the door does not effing exist? Okay, I'm trying not to uh, dissociate again. I'm almost done with these things, okay? And this is self-explanatory indoctrination, right? So we have actually talked about this, but the indoctrination (laughs) shapes the members' beliefs, attitudes, and behaviors. It's a form of thought reform. When you were handed that special secret sauce, secret recipe to salvation, you, you had a moment of thought reform. But indoctrination is an ongoing process. <laughs> so one thing that cults do is they um, expose you to the teachings over and over again, over and over again. And when I saw this point, I was like, oh my God. So in ICOC, periodically, you're always taught, they'll decide to make midweek services or special courses on the Guard the Gospel series. They say that they are helping you to study the Bible better with people, but you're just constantly sitting in a meeting being re-indoctrinated over and over again with the study series, the usage of the scriptures that were used (laughs) to bring you into this organization and to literally erase your mind take over your mind is what I'm saying. It's like the body snatchers. And then you continue to hear it over and over again. We had a guard the gospel series, I don't know how many times. And then you had to take a test. We took a test to see how well we understood guard the gospel. You were to understand what these scriptures really mean. I remember scriptures that were called the, which is hilarious now, the gas scriptures. <laughs> the red flag, the red flags were there. <laughs> Greatly applicable scriptures. These were scriptures, y'all, that we were indoctrinated with to use against anyone who would challenge the way we interpret the scriptures, right? Because everyone has these scriptures, but we're the only ones who interpret them correctly. So there were specific things that people would say, and we were trained to have a specific scripture to go along with that. Be ready with it. Be ready with it. So yes, indoctrination, repeated exposure to the group's teaching and ideology. On lock, ICOC has that on lock. Indoctrination is further achieved with the help of cognitive dissonance. Because listen, when you're in a cult, you're going to experience cognitive dissonance because this is a place that really just wants to control you. It's a place that is redefining their harmful tactics as love and discipline and righteousness. And in order to do that, they have to have some, you have to rationalize some conflicting beliefs. You have to reconcile the things you see versus the things you hear. All right? 
So cognitive dissonance is when you see a red flag, you see things that don't make sense, but you decide to rationalize it some way or you sit in a state of denial. And it's that whole social system that helps you to do that. We talked about that earlier. So, yeah. And with this indoctrination, ultimately, you know, there is that urgency, right? Because we need to save the world. Ultimately, we need to recruit more people. And there's this existential threat to the entire world. And you need to be completely inundated with thoughts of saving everyone around you. And the only way to relieve yourself of this intense stress is to conform to the group's demands. Another thing that makes staying in a cult and conforming to the cult um, something that feels life-threatening is the fact that when you are in a cult, they tell you who you are, right? And if they give, they have given you your purpose, you have cut off everything else, you're in this self-sealing system, you have one function in life, you no longer have any close relationships outside of this group, you don't have any outside sources of information coming in. So when you leave the group, it's like you lose your identity. You lose your purpose. You lose your identity. Who am I? I don't know how many people I've talked to express to me that they had no idea who they were. They left in a complete state of confusion, felt completely lost. These people who were brave enough to say, no, I can't do this. They were brave enough to do it, but they continued to suffer for years. I had one girl tell me that she just decided not to think about God. She knew she couldn't, she could not deal with the environment of ICOC, but the indoctrination was still there. And so she just decided that she wouldn't think about God for seven years because she wasn't going to heaven. So why care? She lost her purpose. She lost her identity as a Christian because she left this place. It took years for her to realize that this place does not have all the stock in God. Cults are so good at this. They provide a sense of purpose, meaning, and identity to their members. So when you challenge the leader, when you challenge the ideology, when you leave this group, it is literally like you're losing your identity. You rupture your sense of self. This place has been your sense of self for however long, and it's being ruptured. I don't know how many people, I'll do that in a second. I don't know how many people have reached out to me since me and Nikita have started making videos and saying, I see what you're saying. I've experienced this. I'm experiencing stuff right now, but I am so afraid that if I leave this church, I will have nothing. And the unfortunate thing is, is that you won't. You won't. You won't have anything for a while. You won't. But that's okay because it's worth it. That actually proves that none of it was real. I'm going to lose my friends. That's a big thing for people. I won't have any more friends. You won't. And that's because they're not real friends. They are people who associate with you because just like you, they're in a self-sealing closed system and they're trying to make the best, make the most of this metaphorical but very realistic invisible jail cell. One thing about cult members, they show up and give their all. Everything is given to these organizations. And the loss of identity and purpose is devastating. Cult members, 
You may have invested significant time, energy, resources. You sacrificed your personal goals and your aspirations in the process. I'm trying not to dissociate. This is a big one for me. And so the prospect of leaving behind this sense of purpose and identity can invoke profound feelings of existential dread and psychological disorientation. You're psychologically disoriented. You are filled with dread. <laughs> and you want to tell me, why didn't you just leave? Why didn't you just, uh, wasn't, it's not like anybody put a gun to your head, silly. No, you're just taking away my whole purpose for existing. My entire system of safety and understanding how the world works. I'm leaving this place completely bare, not knowing where to start. Filled with confusion and a lack of knowing who I am because the only thing you allowed me to be for years was who I was supposed to be in this organization. No, it's just that. This phenomenon that people can experience is something called the sunk cost fallacy. A lot of times it's related to, you know, a financial loss, but it can be attributed to any type of loss. It's the phenomenon whereby a person is reluctant to abandon a strategy or a course of action because they have invested heavily in it. Even when it is clear, clear that abandonment would be more beneficial. This is what people are experiencing. This is what people can't believe. I can't believe that I have invested my whole life into a lie just so someone can control me and grow their downline, grow this pyramid so that someone can sit at the top and enjoy the fruits of my labor, not caring about me as a human. Please tell me that that's not the case. It was. I have always been a person who's not the most jolliest. I've always tried to work really hard to do that. And I thought I had experienced depression before, but it was in that moment when I realized what had been done to me, all the opportunities, all of the decisions I made because I believed I was a true believer in this organization and understanding that it was all a lie. I couldn't get up for days. I felt nothing. I did not know how to laugh anymore. <laughs> I, nothing was funny. Nothing was delightful. It was like I was in this complete state of perpetual darkness and numbness that I did not know how to get out of. This is what people are experiencing. And you want to say, why didn't you just leave? It's not a life or death situation. It is. It absolutely was. So with that being said, it's time to move into some of our video clips that I told you could be a trigger that may require a trigger warning. We're going to look at some of these tactics that are used from the pulpit from ICOC leaders. Now, I didn't have to dig very deep for these clips. Some of these, especially like the first three, you've kind of seen these guys before. But I mean, the things they said and did were just so perfect that I, I got to show it again. I have some clips y'all haven't seen before as well. But I just want to show you what I feel like is such a clever and sneaky way and, and you may think that's not sneaky at all, Asha. And if you do, I am so grateful for you. We need people like you out there saying no to these organizations. But I just feel like it's such a clever and sneaky way to indoctrinate people. 
And this is done publicly from the pulpit. All of these clips are straight from YouTube, public clips that these people are proud of. So you imagine what happens behind closed doors. You imagine what happens on a daily basis. And I just want to tell you something. Your life, when you are a member of ICOC, it is your life. You, this is not a sun, a every Sunday church, a every Wednesday church. It is a every day people are together. Your life is engulfed in these people. So you're constantly being brainwashed every single day. And so with that in mind, again, this is what's coming from the pulpit. Imagine what we're saying to each other every day as we are further and further indoctrinated. And further and further, completely severed and separated from any person, resource, information, idea that's not this group. So here's our first clip. You know, Paul... Guys, we got to get back in the word. We've got to. You know, Paul warned Timothy that he was going to be dealing with people that would be ever learning, but never coming to the knowledge of the truth. God's word is all that Elijah and this widow had to hold on to, and we have got to get back into the Bible. If I hear one more person tell me a new conviction they got because of some podcast they listened to, I'm going to vomit. Okay, so I have a list of things over here. <laughs> what do you think is happening in this clip? This man is, is saying, we need to get back in the word. And that doesn't sound bad. But then you have to think about what he's saying. If I hear one more person tell me about some conviction they got from a podcast i'm going to vomit that is a very weird awkward disturbing thing to say that literally makes no sense but you heard the audience you heard that indoctrinated audience they said yeah oh even though that statement made no sense whatsoever Everybody is groomed that there you have that whole, what is it called? I'm losing the word. Give me one second, y'all. <laughs> the social influence, the system of influence with the social structure of the cult. They, what he said made no sense. It was absolutely disturbing and weird. This man said, I'm disgusted by y'all learning from other people outside of us. That's essentially what he said. Because y'all have podcast. You are a podcast right now. That's why this was up on YouTube. So we can listen to you and gather convictions. But what he's saying is, if it's not from us, don't listen to it. And he's using this thing that makes it, using these words to make it seem like his real concern is, I just want you guys in the word. I just want you guys in the word. Like, that's all I'm doing. Like, <laughs> I'm a good guy. I just want you in your Bible. Duh. <laughs> but remember, the Bible is translated and interpret it in a specific way inside of ICOC. So what he's saying is, we've already told you how you're supposed to see these scriptures, damn it. Why are you going over here listening to Marty Solomon? Why are you going to the Bible Project? Because that's where these people are going. It's not like they're getting Bible lessons from Jim Carrey. And you know, Jim Carrey probably would do amazing Bible lessons. But I mean, these people, you have told them that you are invested in them growing spiritually and we're a Bible-based church and you want them to dig deep and get knowledge. They're going to these sources because that's what they offer. You have told people that the Ethiopian eunuch needed Philip's help. Nobody understands these scriptures without help. They're going to get help. Oh, but you mean they can only get help from you. 
You're going to vomit because I listened to someone who actually has a degree in theology and actually studied this stuff out and is actually teaching me cultural context, historical context, biblical context. You're disgusted by that? And all those people sat there and went, oh, yeah. Mm. So, guys, this is a form of psychological manipulation. It's definitely in this one statement. We see pretty much everything, right? We see psychological manipulation, a.k.a. indoctrination. We see a us versus them. We see a threat of punishment. So, technically, he doesn't say, like... I'm going to hurt you. But he's pretty much saying, people who do this disgust me. And when you are in a cult like ICOC, being thought of, being liked, being thought well of, and being liked by leadership is so important to you. It, it really rattles you to not be in their good graces because they're really good at their hierarchy and... um the way they create, they deify the leaders. That could, that's a whole nother lesson, Lord Jesus. Um, it's a form of isolation and dependency. I'm isolating you from outside sources and making you dependent only on us. Obviously, it is information control. And we, we don't have loss of purpose or identity in this one. But we, I mean, we, we got everything else. All right, let's go on to our next video. So many needs, but if Jesus came back, nothing else matters more than that at the end of the day. That's what it's going to boil down to. There are so many needs, but if Jesus came back right now, the biggest need would be, well, who's getting into heaven? Who's right with God? That has got to be our main focus. And in Canada, Nothing else matters more than. All right. So remember that sense of urgency I was talking about earlier? How cults always create this sense of urgency, and the only thing that can alleviate the distress you feel is complying with the group's rules. That's what he's doing right here. ICOC has this really amazing way of saying, yes, yes, we need to love each other. We need to take care of each other. There are so many needs. But at the end of the day, Jesus only cares about one of them bad boys. And it's getting people to heaven. What are you doing? I don't want to hear that you're depressed. I don't want to hear that you don't feel well. I don't want to hear any of that stuff. Get up, get out. Jesus is coming back and he's going to be looking at you like you're crazy because you didn't do all you could to make sure people are saved. Now, again, some of you who are Christians may feel like, but I mean, I guess that's kind of true. But remember, in this organization, they have this secret recipe. And it's a us versus them. They actually dictate whether or not they are a successful church, a successful organization based on how it grows. This is a cult. So this is the sense of urgency to continue growing the lower bottom part of that pyramid so they can continue to funnel in more money, more bodies to further their initiative of making sure they indoctrinate people into this self-sealing closed system of us versus them this is the only way to become a christian and come on this is is actually very cruel is actually very deceptive and it's actually very dangerous to tell people that jesus really doesn't care about all of your other random needs that all needs to go into the back burner that's literally not true. We all know the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with your heart, mind, soul, body. And the second is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. We are supposed to see people's needs. That is what the whole, you know, story of the Good Samaritan is all about. This Good Samaritan who took care of this person's needs was the only one who was not 
doing things right in the way the Jewish people saw righteousness. So it wasn't about making sure everyone follows this rule, gets this right. It's about taking care of your fellow man. Jesus made this very clear and ICOC changes and distorts this narrative. And you can see it because the thing that he pitted against saving people is taking care of people's needs. He he communicated the needs as a competition to saving people. This is a distraction. This is something that is holding you back from doing your real purpose, what Jesus really cares about. And it's a lie. It is wrong. It is inaccurate. It is like at this point, he is literally being biblically inaccurate on purpose. But this is to create that sense of urgency to make it so that people can't relax, people can't find comfort, people can't rest and not experience a reduction in their anxiety until they fulfill the agenda of this organization. All right, let's look at another clip, shall we? Like that, uh, do you call up someone? Do you call your mentor, your discipleship partner, your discipler? Um, do you call a person you're discipling? Uh, do you have a go-to person? Do you call your therapist? Do you call your parents? I hope not, man. You know, I mean, even if your parents are elders in the church, I mean, you gotta, you're, you're risking a lot right there calling them. I'm not saying don't. I'm just saying count the cost. You know what I'm saying? They got to have a really good relationship with both of y'all to make that work, okay? Just don't drag your parents into your stuff, all right? But how do you handle it? How do you deal with your issues? Not your parents, not people who actually care about your well-being and won't tell you to suck it up so that you can stay in this marriage, which benefits this cult and sacrifice your happiness and your sanity and maybe a relationship that isn't healthy. Mm, not them, anyone but them. So class, we can probably see which of these things here in the list was being leveraged in this short clip of the marriage retreat, mm, marriage retreat that just happened just, just this past February, guys. So this isn't old. This just happened this February. We see psychological manipulation. We see us versus them. And we definitely see isolation and dependency and information control all in a really short clip. All in a really short clip. It's just amazing. Okay, so what was done in this clip? Did y'all pick it up? So the question that this couple are proposing <laughs> to the audience is how do you handle problems that arise in your relationship? How do you handle it? And it turns into a real quick question of watch who you entrust yourself to. And he's given these options, right? These options of who do you go to for help? Who helps you in your relationship? He's like, <laughs> He says the same person multiple different ways. Is it your discipler, your discipleship partner, your discipling friends, other disciples, your discipling buddies, the discipling couple, the discipling, discipling disciples, your therapist? <laughs> and he had to throw in therapist in there because apparently he's a therapist. Y'all can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think I looked it up and he's actually a therapist. So, yeah. Um, and, you know, and you notice how nobody goes, oh, no, when he asked them 50 different ways if they talk to another member of the church. But when he said, do you talk to your parents? Which for 99% of the people in this organization, their parents are not part of this church. Do you talk to your parents? And immediately his tone changes. You talk to your parents. And then everybody is like, oh, never. Mm, uh, bro. 
Everybody knows how to respond. Everybody knows how to respond. That's that social influence as well. If you didn't know before that it was not acceptable for you to go to people who actually care about you, about your problems, you know now. You know now. You know now. Because you heard that mm, from the audience. And again, it's something that doesn't make sense outside of this cult, right? Because if you've never been in a cult, you're probably like, of course I talk to my parents. I talk to the elders in my community, people who I can learn from. What does he mean? Why is that a bad thing? Well, it's a bad thing because it's a cult, girl. (laughs) Just kidding. It's a bad thing because you're only supposed to be getting information encouragement, instruction from others in the organization because they control the narrative. They are the ones who, and if you haven't watched me and Nikita's video on the marrieds ministry, listen, just go watch it and you'll even understand even further why this is such a big deal. When you're in a cult and people only care about furthering the agenda and you've only been able to marry and be in this organization and your marriage is a representation of the organization, you reflect the narrative that this organization puts out. They don't care about you. People are experiencing terrible things in these marriages, particularly women, and they're being told to suck it up. Everyone's being told to suck it up. Everyone's being told to make yourself less, particularly women, to make the marriage work. There are so many different abuses going on in so many people's relationships. The stories that have been shared with us since we did that Mary's lesson are heartbreaking. So in this system, the marriages are like a cult within a cult. Again, go look at that other video. But at the end of the day, they do all they can to make sure you don't talk to people outside of the cult. And especially not your parents. Especially not your parents. Why not your parents? Because these are people who actually care about you. If you tell your parents what you're going through, they may have a very different response than the people in this cult. They might actually help you. They might actually be there for you. They might actually give you resources to help you set yourself free. Don't tell them. You're supposed to make sure your family thinks that everything is perfect and everything is great because you're the disciple and they're not and they don't know how to have a marriage and you do. So why would you go to them and make us look bad? (laughs) You notice how he said, (laughs) he, he tried his best. He was like, I'm not saying you can't. Because that's how ICOC does, right? They're really trying hard to not come across controlling. They're really trying hard not to come across controlling anymore. So they try. I'm not saying you can't do it. I'm not saying you can't do it. Just, I mean, but count the cost. Well, count the cost is such one of those um, uh, subliminal thought-stopping phrases of ICOC. Somebody tells you to count the cost. The cost is hell. The cost is being destroyed. So when you throw that sentence out there, you're really saying don't do it. That he could have stopped right there. He could have stopped that. I'm just saying come to cost. (laughs) Sorry. I can't stop. (laughs) Come to cost. But then he goes, I mean, the person, even if it's an elder in the church. So now he's trying to seem like I'm not just talking about people outside. But the fact that he has to stop and say, even if they're an elder in the church, because you know who he was talking about. He was talking about all of you who have family outside of the church. You cannot talk to them. So now he's got to include people who are even in church because that's not who he was talking about before. So even, even if it's an um, a elder in the church, maybe not because they have to, you know, care about both of you, you know, or know you both really well. Why? Because you have to not truly care about the person in this situation because the people have to stay in the marriage no matter what because that makes the church look good. So when he says they have to know you really well, you have to be someone who understands that at the end of the day, the goal is to keep the marriage together no matter what abuses the person is going through. That's what he was really saying, in my opinion. 
But then he just lets the mask completely slip. He couldn't hold it on anymore. He goes, just, I mean, just don't push it. Bring your parents in your stuff. His whole demeanor changes. The real answer is, I do care. I am telling you what to do. And don't bring in your parents. Let us handle it. Because we have a face to save. We need to look a certain way. We need to prove a point to the outsider so we can recruit more. Over there talking to people who actually care about you. Have you lost your damn mind? Anyway, all right. And now we are moving on to the next video. You ready? I don't know if y'all ready for this one. Let's go. Let's do it. We need to see Christ church as he sees it. Not with all, when we look, we see all the stains and the wrinkles. Well, let me tell you what's wrong with the church. Okay, thanks. We needed somebody who had clarity to let us know. We were so confused. We thought something was wrong. Well, you know, technically it's not your church, our church. It's Jesus' bride. That's what it's called. And one must take that into account when they criticize the bride in front of the groom. Imagine going up to the groom and saying, hey, let me tell you how your bride could have fixed herself up a little bit better. I'm not sure her makeup is quite right. Are you turning to somebody and saying, oh, I, bet, I, I thought she could have d done this. I didn't quite like the dress. He makes some snide remark about her appearance, her hair. Did you see that little mark? Oh, wow. She walked down the aisle. That was so funny. She walked down like a duck. <laughs> you have a pretty good idea what a groom would do with such remarks. You have a pretty good idea what he might say, and you have an idea what he might do. <laughs> you talking about my bride? You talking about my bride? With your little, you know, it's a punch in the nose kind of affair, right? <laughs> we ins yet we insult Christ's bride without even a thought about how he, Jesus, might feel about that. Do you know how serious that might be? Do you know how serious that might be? I mean, we want to do everything possible to make everything perfect for that occasion in the next slide, you know? Mm, mm, mm. Okay. Okay, y'all. Now, I want to say something. This guy right here is definitely one of those top, top leaders of ICOC. One of the people Kip left behind to keep the ideology going strong. And this person was actually my church leader personally for I think like over 10 years. And let me tell you something, I was a true believer. I was indoctrinated into this cult. You would never have told me that I would be sitting here critiquing one of his lessons and telling you how absolutely horrid it is. I would have never, as a matter of fact, I would tremble at the thought. But here we are, so let's get the into it, shall we? So we see a bunch of things in this clip. Lots of psychological manipulation. There's actually lots of little threats in this one. This one, I see threat of punishment. And I absolutely see information control. So we saw early on with the whole us versus them, one of the things, you know, we looked at were a lot of scriptures, right? Because you're in the system, you have this secret knowledge. So now you are truly 
in the kingdom of God. This and only this is the kingdom of God. When you are a member of this church, that's what you believe. If you want to keep lying to yourself, go ahead on, but we all know it. And it's actually made evident in this lesson right here. Because he's taking that power dynamic, that understanding that all these people in this church have, and he's using it against them right now, right now in this lesson. He knows that everyone who's a member of this church thinks that this is truly God's one and only church. So he says it with, he says it without hesitation. When you talk about this church, you're talking about Christ's bride. This is Jesus's wife you're talking about. And he knows how heavy that is. He knows how heavy that statement is. Because everyone in this cult has been indoctrinated into understanding this because we have the one and only truth is truly Christ's body. The church is not only Christ's body, it's his bride. So I want to set the stage for you. This is kind of like toward the middle, I believe, of 2023, either half or two thirds down the line of 2023. This church is going through a lot because the Rolling Stones article came out about ICOC. If you don't know what that is, just Google it. But as a result, it goes into detail about a lot of heinous things that were done in this church and that were covered up. People who have been members of the church and have had an idea of what this church stood for are being punched in the face with the reality of what has really happened. And then they're seeing these lacking responses from leaders. They're seeing these responses that are continuing this narrative um, controlling behavior, minimizing what's been done to children, wondering if there are any more secrets. People are rightfully up in an uproar because of the information that they have learned about this organization. People are leaving left and right. People are standing up and saying, this is wrong. People aren't buying what they are selling anymore. And people are starting to come out of their cognitive dissonance. They're starting to say, no, this and this doesn't match. It doesn't match. And I'm not going to say it matches anymore because they are done. They are horrified at what they have just learned. And they're even more horrified at the responses. And they're saying this and this doesn't match. What are y'all going to do? Are you going to be the church you say you are? Are you going to be the church you held me? Are you going to hold are you going to hold yourselves to the standard that you've held me to all these years? Are you going to do it? And this is the response. What you see right here is the response, baby. Oh, the church has problems. Thanks a lot. I didn't know. He starts off being sarcastic. Like, "Oh, thanks a lot. I guess you're so damn smart." Yeah, I know y'all saw that. Then he goes on to say, the church, us, this church, it's not even yours. It's Christ's bride. Christ is going to punch you in the nose. <laughs> That's punch in the nose behavior. You're going to criticize the bride? Do you know what can happen to you? Have you thought about what can happen to you? Instead of him coming as a spiritual leader and saying, yes, this stuff was horrible, I understand your rage. He comes with threats. He comes with a threat. And what is the threat? That you're pissing Christ off and he's going to punish you. Keep running your mouth and see what Jesus doesn't do to you. He's threatening the congregation with Jesus. Why? Because people are rightfully upset and feel for the first time for a long of them unsafe in this environment. And the scales are falling from their eyes. And they're like, what the hell have I been a part of? And this church does what this church does. He is threatening them. With what? With their relationship with God. 
He's threatening you with your relationship with God. He's saying, stop talking. Stop talking. Shut up. Before God smites you. And I didn't add all the clips. Because let me tell y'all. I think I need to do a completely whole other video. On this lesson. There are parts of this lesson where he says. We need to be covering over. The mistakes of the bride. Not exposing it. He actually says that. Cover the mistakes y'all. Make the bride look good. And then he uses some scriptures. Let's see if I have notes up here with the scripture he used. Because y'all. Hold on. No, I don't. He's you. He pulls out some scriptures. I can't remember where it's at, but it's a scripture where Paul is talking to Timothy and he's telling Timothy, you know, go ahead of me to this place. So that you can teach them how they ought to behave. Yeah. And then he says, ought is in the future tense. Because it's not who we are now, but it's who we ought to be. Because we're getting there. So until then, cover over the mistakes. Like the lesson doesn't make any sense. And you hear those people, come on, Mike. Yeah, yeah. He's literally telling you, you don't get to speak out. This is a church that prides itself on being true followers of the Bible, that we hold each other accountable. We confess our sin. We call each other higher. But when you're trying to expose the things that we have tried to keep hidden, you will be punished. There's that double standard again. There's that damn double standard. When I call you out, when I embarrass you in front of the fellowship, when I disfellowship you, when I make you come back and read a letter confessing all your sin before we let you back in the door, that is just following Jesus. And that is just simply being a good disciple. But when you say, hey, you don't match leadership. You don't match. You've been a hypocrite. You've been calling us to a standard that you have not called yourself to. You have hidden heinous acts of abuse against children. And you're pretending like it's not a big deal. We don't feel safe. He's like, how dare you? How dare you insult Christ's bride? You see how many times in this video he's like, <laughs> he squints his eyes up at the audience. Who are you to talk? Who are you to criticize Christ's bride? We are the bride. You don't become the bride without having behavior that is conducive of being the bride. You're the bride because of your behavior. Your love and your compassion and your empathy and your truth is what makes you the bride. That's very clear in the scriptures. He's literally changing scripture right now interpreting it in a completely different way to silence these people to shame them he's putting shame it's a projection the shame is really on them as the leadership for what they have done he's projecting that shame onto the audience We are absolutely supposed to hold each other accountable. Isn't that what you said? But when I'm holding you accountable, I'm criticizing Christ's bride and he's going to smack me in the face. And you hear it. Mm, come on, Mike. Yeah, they're laughing at his jokes like they're funny. They're not funny. They're not funny. This man literally said, hide, hide the mistakes. What are you doing? Changing the tense of the word ought to make that scripture not say what it actually says. Yeah, so psychological manipulation 
threats of punishment, information control. Absolutely. All right, guys, we made it through the videos. All right, so we are done with the videos. But I just want to show you a response from someone after hearing that lesson from the previous clip. Right. Again, this is one of the heavy hitters of ICOC. And he came into town all the way from on the opposite side of the world, traveled here to put everybody in this congregation back in check. So you heard the lesson. The lesson is this is Christ's bride. Who do you think you are? And I, I can't help but to show you a screenshot of a Facebook post from one of the members. Now, I do want to preface this by saying I'm not going to tell you who this member is. I'm not. I'm cropping out any names. Um, and I do want to say that this is a person who I sincerely think is a good person who is completely indoctrinated, a true believer of what this cult preaches. What's beautiful about this person is that being a true believer and being such a pure hearted person, they don't have the deceptive ways of communicating the agenda of this cult to that other people do. So they just say, he, he will just say what he knows these people, these top leaderships really want. He'll just say it. Other people kind of know we don't say that out loud. Well, you don't, you don't actually say that out loud. Other people kind of know that. He just says it. So is the reason I'm sharing this screenshot is to show you what people got out of this lesson. Because it's there. It's right there. This is what they were meant to get out of it. It's not what was said, but it is what you were meant to get out of it. It was what you were meant to understand. So let's break it down. This church member says, and this is so encouraging, right? He, he's so happy after seeing this lesson. Nothing about God can change because God is all that is. What changes is our ability to understand, receive, and express God in our lives. Hashtag here am I, send me. Hashtag stand up. Hashtag Isaiah 6 verse 8. I'm, I didn't look to see what that was about. And then he finishes the statement with no matter what we go through, are going through, hashtag we must stay unified. Great time today at Sunday service. You see that? No matter what we go through or are going through, we must stay unified. Because God doesn't change. What he's saying is the message that I learned from this place when I first became a member has not changed. What changes is my ability to understand and perceive it. He is literally explaining how brainwashing works. I have to bend my mind to this message. And then he finishes it with stand up. Stand up. Stand up for what? The bride. Because no matter what we go through, are going through, we must stay unified. That sentence in and of itself is so damn dangerous. That's the sentence of someone who is indoctrinated into a cult. Absolutely not. So once again, what has happened in this church is that there are lawsuits. There are lawsuits regarding children who were SA'd in this organization and it was covered up. And this person's reaction is no matter what we go through are going through. We must stay unified. And when this person says we must stay unified, they don't mean unified. They mean we must conform. We must protect the bride. We do not have a say. We do not get to veer off and disagree. 
Great service. Great, great Sunday service. Thank you. Thanks you for so much for that reminder that I don't have a choice. Nobody else posted this on their wall, but he did. And he will always be posting stuff like this. I mean, it's, it's amazing, the stuff that gets posted. And again, I say this because this person's heart is so pure. They really believe in the messaging of this place. And they will always communicate what they actually heard. And this is what he heard. This is absolutely so dangerous. No one should be pledging their allegiance like this to an organization saying no matter what we go through, are going through. No, there absolutely are circumstances where you should no longer be unified. You break your unity with, with an organization that behaves like this. An organization that thinks it's okay to harm little children and cover it up to protect their image, you absolutely break your unity with an organization like that. An organization that still came out after these articles came out and said, we haven't had anything like that happen here. And then had to retract that and come back out and say, yes, we did because people called them on it. And even in that letter, proceeded to say, but if you hear of anything going on in here, talk to one of the elders. They didn't say talk to the police. All the red flags are there, have been there, will always be there because this organization has an agenda that they will always find a way to fulfill. And that's one of the reasons I'm showing you recent clips of everything. This is absolutely a dangerous way of thinking. This person is literally saying, we must stay together no matter what. No. Let me remind you what you actually said yes to before all of that was twisted, mangled, and disheveled in your brain. This organization attracted you saying that we all are faithful to Jesus. You notice how Jesus isn't anywhere in that statement. It's that we, like a doggone you know, cartel must stay unified. No, it is Jesus's words that you must stay true to. People in this organization have stopped comparing themselves to Jesus's word. It damn sure won't in that clip we just watched. <sighs> so yeah, just wanted to show you all that. So this is what happens. This is why people don't leave cults. Here are the examples in your face. There's too much manipulation. There's a us versus them. There is a separation of you from other sources of information, other resources, people who will really support you. You are indoctrinated and you are in there. You are stuck. It takes so much to get freed from it. Long story short, I feel like we have covered it enough that cults absolutely do make conformity a life or death situation. You've seen it especially in that last clip. I have shared all of this information with you and there's still more research. There's still more research. There's, there's more that cults do to you. And that's not all folks. And one more thing that cults do is they literally change. And when I say change, I mean atrophy, shrink your brain. Why? Let's, let's look at it, okay? The use of these fear tactics, coercion, or threats of punishment, which we just saw, so you can't say they don't do it. Ooh, the use of fear tactics, coercion, or threats of punishment to compel obedience and conformity creates a climate of anxiety and apprehension, inhibiting individuals' ability to think critically and make autonomous decisions. Over time, because this is what your brain is supposed to effing do. All right, calm down, Ash. Over time, this environment, right, contributes to cognitive impairment and atrophy in regions associated with decision making and emotional regulation in your faces, in your faces. I'm just kidding, not in your faces.
This is real. This is real. When we're not using our brains, when we're not thinking critically, when we're not making decisions about our lives, when we don't have autonomy over ourselves, our brains are like, oh, so you're just not going to use this. Oh, so I guess I'll cut these parts of your brain off and your brain shrinks. So you want to tell somebody, no one made you do it. There is a door right there. Nobody put a gun to your head. No ho. But they did shrink my damn brain, turn off my decision-making capabilities to the point where it's actually literally a muscle, a part of my brain I have to build back up. Not to mention the belief system I have that makes it impossible Makes it literally impossible because I'm so afraid of eternal damnation. I'm sweating. And you, know, Dr. Henry Cloud literally has a program for this. He literally wrote a new book called Churches That Heal because the research is out there. Churches that step on pedestals or have a hierarchy and, and threaten people this way, isolate people this way, interpret the Bible in this dangerous way, hurt people and cause mental illness. Look it up. Henry Cloud, Churches That Heal. He has a whole course. To the point where he has made it so affordable for whole churches to have their um, staff go through this, this course, so that they can stop doing what they're doing to people. Yes, if you are wondering, yes, I did recommend this before I left the church. Yes, I was told no, that they just want to go back to the way things were. There you go. Okay, so with that being said, I want to show a clip. I told you we were going to jump into Dr. Romani and Dr. Lalich. However, I do have another cult expert, someone who's deeply involved in this research of the brain and what it does to the brain. Like she has a whole foundation because cults literally rewire your brains. They do. And her name is Diane Ben Scotter. And she has this TED talk where she's explaining what happens in cults, what happens to your brain. Okay. She was someone who was actually in a cult as well. So she's a specialist and she experienced it. She was actually a part of the Moonies. So let's hear what she has to say. And so what is this? What, how does this work? And what I came, how I come to view what happened to me is a viral mimetic infection. For those of you who aren't familiar with mimetics, a meme has been defined as an idea that replicates in the human brain and moves from brain to brain like a virus. Much like a virus, the way a virus works is it's most, it can infect and do the most damage to someone who has a compromised immune system, right? In 1974, I was young, I was naive, and I was pretty lost in my world. I was really idealistic. These easy ideas to complex questions are very appealing when you are emotionally vulnerable. What happens is that circular logic takes over. Moon is one with God. God is going to fix all the problems in the world. All I have to do is humbly follow, because God is going to stop war and hunger, all these things I wanted to do. All I have to do is humbly follow, because after all, God's the Messiah. He's going to fix all this. It becomes impenetrable. And the most dangerous part of this is that it creates us and them, right and wrong, good and evil. And it makes anything possible, it makes anything rationalizable. Mm. Her logic that she experienced in her cult just feels so damn familiar. The circular thinking, being idealistic and being fed this secret knowledge from a cult is literally like an infection that takes over your brain. So circular logic and ICOC. 
The Bible is the word of God. It saves us from hell. This church alone teaches the Bible. I must remain faithful no matter what. Isn't that what that Facebook post just said? When you have this circular logic, right? It just keeps you stuck. Let me get in the middle of the circle. I mean, what am I supposed to do? The Bible is the word of God. It saves me from hell. It's salvation. It's truth. And this church had the understanding of what these scriptures were really telling me. They are the church. They are the chosen ones. They are the bride of Christ. What can I do? I have to remain faithful no matter what. Well, Asha, there's all these things. I mean, what about this? What about that? What about that? This doesn't match. I don't under, I don't know what to do with that, but I do know one thing. I don't want to go to hell. I do know another thing. This church teaches the Bible. So really, does anything else matter? Nothing else matters. Where would I go anyway? God actually put me here. I mean, his truth is here. God had to have put me here. I don't see that I really have a choice. Where would I go? You see in John chapter six, the disciples had the same dilemma. The truth is what really matters. And you know what? I'm really supposed to focus on heaven. And I think that God is going to work it all out because this is the body of Christ. It has to be because of this truth. So God will ultimately work everything out. And God is with me. You don't understand. I need God with me. If I leave this place, I sincerely believe that God is no longer with me. God is with me is if I remain here. So if this place teaches this truth and God is with us, it has to be good. You see how I'm rationalizing everything? It's circular logic. This is what people are stuck in. When you're in a call and you're telling them, you could have just left. Left what? To my spiritual death to damnation to the world that hates me to nothing to no family no resources no friends feeling utterly horrified about what will happen to me if i step away from the body of christ and have no more connection to the head are you serious so no no you did not have a bad guy show up and point a gun to your head. You didn't. What happened to you if you were in a cult was actually worse. It was actually worse. Because when a bad guy shows up and puts a gun to your head and says, give me all your money, you know who the bad guy is. It's him. He right there. I just need to give this person my money and get away from them. Oh my God, hopefully they get arrested. You just want to get away from the bad guy. But hey, when you're in a cult, the bad guy looks like this. This is your threat. It doesn't even look like a threat. Your threat looks like this. You don't know that there is a threat. You think you have found family, friends, a purpose, the truth. You are safe. You have literally found salvation. So when you start to feel that discomfort, that uneasiness, instead of going, bad guy, right there, you sit in a ball of confusion because you don't know why you're not happy. You go, wait a minute, I'm supposed to be happy. This is God's kingdom. God is with me now. God was never with me before. Why was I happy before? Was I really happy before? I can't say that. Oh my God, oh my God, why am I not happy? And you are like, what is, what is, what is the, the problem? I don't understand, I don't understand. You sit in a ball of confusion. And because you can't get out of the circular logic, what you first usually do, what usually first happens to people who are in a cult is that they go, hmm, I guess the bad guy is me. This place is perfect. This place is perfect. Why? Because it's led by the Bible. The Bible is the word of God. 
It saves us from hell. This church teaches the Bible, which is my salvation. It is truth. It is my happiness. It is my only hope. So I must remain faithful to it. So if I am sitting here unhappy, then the bad guy is me. And then when you finally realize that you've been lied to, even after you leave, you're still like, I'm the bad guy. You feel like you're the bad guy because now you have to face all of the people that you have abandoned, all the people who weren't good enough for you because they weren't a part of your cult. You have to face possible rejection from them. You have to face possible shaming from them. Not only that, but now the people from the cult have shamed you, have labeled you a fall away, are telling you to shut up and stop talking about it are telling you to move on, stop being bitter, are calling you a fall away, telling people that you just don't love God anymore. So you still feel like the bad guy. On top of that, you don't even know who you are anymore. You have given everything to this cult. And so you look in the mirror and you're like, who am I? What do I do now? What is my personality? I remember having this moment. I remember staring at the walls of my home and realizing the only reason I was in there was because I had limited myself to a region where the church thought it was acceptable for me to live. That I hadn't made any big decisions in my adult, my big 40 year old age (laughs) that were outside of getting permission from this cult and it was a lie. And I had the biggest bout of depression and existential dread, not wanting to live. And you are asking me why I just didn't walk away. Take a breath, Asha. So no, no, as I said before, a gun was not pointed to your head. It was way worse than that. It was way worse than that. So now I have a treat for you guys. Let's let's listen to some of the amazing wisdom of these women who I adore so much who came together to do a podcast, Dr. Laylich and Dr. Romani. I don't know why I start speaking like a New York Italian woman when I mention their names. I don't know what's happening. I honestly don't know why I did that. I'm sorry. But anyway, what we're going to listen to are some clips from the podcast, Navigating Narcissism, What is a Cult, with Dr. Laylich on Dr. Romney's podcast, okay? Y'all ready? I'm ready. Let's do this. I found this concept of bounded choice to be one of the most fascinating things I had ever read. I'd never, the terminology really captured something. Correct me if I'm wrong. We have a certain spectrum of choice, okay? What you're describing as bounded choice is an absolute narrowing of that, of that spectrum of choice, what you're calling a self-sealing system where you don't have any glimpse of a touchstone or reality outside of that relationship. So although one looking from the outside will say, there's a door, walk through it, that is <laughs> actually, that full spectrum of choice no longer exists. It's like the door doesn't exist or the door yeah. is locked, right? Because the reason this is so, mm, for for me is that this is in many ways the paradox of people in narcissistic relationships. Again, not nearly at the level of what we're talking about in terms of the level of coercion and danger and harm of stories we're talking about. But even in your garden variety narcissistic relationship, that spectrum of choice narrows to this really bounded realm of if I leave, people may think badly of me. I might, you know, it, it, the system is not going to understand who this person's about. So the custody of the children will be affected or my culture will cast me out or I financially may not be or, able to make it. 
or or he'll come after me or yes. I'll lose the children or correct or right. the post separation abuse so and i think this is every narcissistic relationship ever and that what happens is even therapists are guilty of this and which is supposed to be a compassionate system forget about law enforcement on all those other advocacy and and um, justice systems they don't understand bounded choice. Even therapists don't. So we'll often get into this mindset of like, well, leaving is an option. And I'm often like squirming in my chair. I'm like, I don't know that it is. When you gave me this term, bounded choice, I just want to let you know, Do Dr. Yanya, this terminology has greatly helped therapists. So thank you for that. And I've sort of been the yeah. mouthpiece for that term in clinical realms. And because it's a, it's it really gets at what survivors can, they're like, I don't feel like I can leave this. So like, yeah, literally I know I can, but I actually don't think I can. I so much appreciate that. Um, and, you know, I mean, that idea of there's the door and you can't go through it. I lived that for five years mm. in the cult that I was in. I was ready to leave and I couldn't, I could not figure out how to do it. I would get up every morning, get in the shower, cry my eyes out because we weren't allowed to cry. We should have no emotions. <laughs> And I'd get in my car, and I would just wish that I'd be killed in a car accident because it was the only way I could see to get out. Mm-hmm. Mm. Mm-mm-mm. mm 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 You'll notice that Dr. Romani calls her Dr. Yanya. Yanya is her first name. I'm calling her by her last name. Um, so just in case there's any confusion. But Dr. Yanya has written a book, or Dr. Lalish, about bounded choice. And you hear what they're saying. People don't feel like they can leave because they cannot picture a reality outside of this system. And that's why I spent so much time showing scriptures of the us versus them paradigm because it is that piece that takes away that vision of a life outside of this group. That is real. And so many cults feel this. People don't understand it. Even therapists are guilty of not really grasping this. And do you see how they're interacting? Dr. Romani's like, oh my gosh, you gave me this term because I have seen this. Everybody doesn't have a choice. It's like the door doesn't exist. And this is something that people need to understand. And I love Dr. Lalich's um, vulnerability, how she's like, I get it. I was in my cult for five years and her cult wasn't even religious, but it's very similar. You hear how she says, I will wake up. I will go cry in the shower because we weren't allowed to cry. That's very familiar. Now, in ICOC, you can cry if somebody dies, if it's something that they feel is really worthy of grieving. But you'll hear very often the word emotion isn't in the Bible which is a form of indoctrination, right? Because the Bible in and of itself, you read through the Psalms, you see a myriad, a cornucopia of emotions that David went through. People will talk about David. He is the man after God's own heart, King David, King David. But we won't talk about all the emotion he expressed because we're busy telling you that the word emotion isn't in the Bible to discredit your emotions, to tell you they aren't valid. So it's the same thing. All If you actually, I know that some of you who are... <laughs> A part of ICOC, if you're watching this, you're part of ICOC, you're highly discouraged from looking at any dissenting content. But I dare you, I dare you to start looking at all the cult content. Because let me tell you, God is tired of being mocked. There is cult content coming out left and right all over the place, okay? Um, and re listen to other people's stories. Listen, um, I can't think of her name, the woman, and I, I love her too, who escaped Scientology, go listen to her podcast from King of Queens. I feel so bad. All I hear in my hair right now is Lalich, Lalich. <laughs> um, go listen to her podcast, listen to her stories. You're going to hear yourself in them. They all have the same tactics, all have the same tactics. All right. Bounded choice. There are choices 
but they're bounded in this self-sealing system. So if you heard me use that word throughout this video, I definitely got it from Dr. Lalich. It's a self-sealing system. You have choices. You can choose where to go to eat. You can choose to, you know, go to work today. <laughs> You can choose to hang out with any of your friends inside of the church. You can hang out with any of your friends outside of the church as long as you know you make sure that you're not closer to them than people who are inside and you don't hang out on them on days when we are meeting because you better put the kingdom first. That's a bounded choice. That's a bounded choice. Yeah, your kids can play sports as long as the practices aren't on Wednesday nights. And if practices are on Wednesday nights. I guess your kid can't play that sport. That's a bounded choice. Listen, listen. If you still don't understand, I don't know what to tell you. Let's look at this video. And this is why so many people, especially at a higher level in a cult, um, experience what we call, and I'm sure you're familiar, moral injury. Yeah you know, which is the effect of not just what happened to you, but what you did to others mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or that you saw happen to others and that you couldn't do anything about. So, yes, I think. Mm. I thought that this was a really important point that they were talking about in the video. There's this something called moral injury that happens to you when you are in a cult. So I do want to pay attention to this. I think a lot of people come after people who speak out because we are aggravating the moral injury they have. Me sitting here pointing out the fact that this place was a thousand percent harmful. People will deal with psychological damage for the rest of their lives. It was not worth it. And people's lives were stolen remind so many of us who were members that we were a part of that, and that is painful. That's a very painful thing to deal with. But you got to deal with it. I think the moral injury is something that is so difficult when you have betrayed your best friends, you've betrayed your parents, your loved ones. And if you were a person in this church who raised your children in this cult, you have, I feel like, the greatest amount of moral injury than any of us. And I am so sorry for what you went through. I am so sorry for the indoctrination that you experience that caused you to betray your children. But your children's pain is real. It's real. They are the innocent ones, the most innocent in this system, and they have absolutely been unequivocally harmed. By being raised in this system. Don't believe me? Go listen to the Space Makers podcast. Listen to the stories of these children who were raised in this system. I am sorry for your moral injury. There is grace for you in that. But you cannot try and silence other people because you don't like seeing and knowing what actually happened. Believe me, I get it. But I promise you that there's real healing when you actually decide to deal with what happened to you. The things you did and the things you did indirectly because you couldn't stop them from happening to other people. Because you were in this extremely harmful situation, your brain was atrophied, you were in a system of circular thinking, and you were afraid for your life. That was real. All right, let's look at another video. I think I have just two more clips. 
one you started with was an interesting one to me. You have to accept that you've been had, right? And I understand that to be the subjective experience of a survivor, whether in a cold mm -hmm. system and a narcissistic relationship. From my seat as a, as a therapist, it's the, I think that when we feel we've been had, we feel foolish, like we've been played, mm -hmm. right? Like somebody just, just did a street mm -hmm. con on us. But in mm -hmm. fact, what had happened was all the healthy functioning parts of yourself, a desire to belong, a commitment to a cause, a drawing right. to like-minded people, healthy parts of yourself were drawn right. into something. Right. In a mm -hmm. relationship, it might be that you saw something in this person, that you believed in love, that you um, that you right. wanted to build a life with them, ha healthy stuff. And then to find out that, in fact, that's not what this the social contract was on their side. It does right. feel like being had, but it's not really that you were foolish. It wasn't a, it wasn't that you were foolish and got played by a street right. con because you rolled up to a game of three-card Monty. It's more that you right. had gone in with all the best parts of yourself and ran Absolutely. into something harmful. Is that that self-forgiveness in that process that this was the best of you, you know, you exactly. were taken advantage of. And that, 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 that exploitativeness is an important part of the psychoeducation on what happens Absolutely. to in systems. I mean, I, I get asked all the time, you know, is there a certain personality type who joins a cult? And I'm like, you know what, if there's any common denominator, it's idealism. Mm. You know, mm. it's people who want a better world, a better self, mm -hmm. a better family, you know, a better belief, spiritual belief, whatever. But it's not because people, as I said earlier, are stupid, weird, crazy, lazy. That's not who cult members want. Right. I mean, cult leaders want. And so you, you, while you have to accept that you did it and went along with it, you also have to realize that there was nothing wrong with you. <laughs> right. Like this happens right. to everybody. Mm -hmm. It can mm -hmm. happen to anybody. Mm -hmm. And... That clip almost made me cry quite a few times. I don't know if these two women just realize how healing it is that they came together to do this video. <laughs> Please go and watch it. I think another reason and the reason I added this clip to this very long <laughs> YouTube video is because I think another one of the reasons why people have such a hard time with people speaking out about their experience in a cult and they're so quick to go, well, why did you stay? You could have left. You were an adult. You had your brain. Is because they have a hard time accepting the fact that they have been had. I know I have to take a deep breath saying that. I remember that feeling, like I said, of sitting on the edge of my bed and realizing it's a lie I've been had. The scriptures have been used against me. And you hate yourself. I have hated myself for the past few years. Because I'm like, how? How did I miss all of these red flags? And that's why talking about this stuff is so helpful. There are people who have unalived themselves because of their experience with this cult. And if someone can find others speaking out about this and it gives them hope, it helps them to be seen then that's what we do this for. It's worth it. But yes, when you are in a cult, you've been had, but there's nothing wrong with you. You're not stupid or lazy. The best of you was exploited. You showed up with the best of you. You wanted a better world. You wanted a relationship with God. You wanted a better family. You wanted to help people. That's who showed up in this cult. There was nothing ever wrong with you. People like to ask questions of, what's wrong with you? How did you join a cult? There's nothing wrong. This can happen to anybody, and it absolutely does happen to so many. 
a cult shows up in your life at the right time where you are extra vulnerable and idealistic about wanting better for yourself, believe me, it happens to everybody and it can happen to anybody. Someone exploited all the goodness that you showed up with. They took the healthy, they act, and I, I love that Dr. Romney said that they took the healthy parts of you. What showed up to the cult was this healthy side of you. They took it and distorted it. They took it and distorted it, ripped it apart. And constructed it in their image. There was nothing wrong with you. So if you're someone who just can't take people continuing to talk about their experience with the cult because it secretly brings you shame and you don't like hearing people explain that, no, we have been taken for a ride, please understand it's not the taken for a ride of someone who is foolish, someone who doesn't know anything. They um, are lazy or just out of it or, you know, just there's something wrong with you. I just don't know what words to use at this point. I'm starting to run out of words at the end of this video. It was the best, most healthy version of you that showed up because you wanted to do something good with the world. I just hope you can hear that. All right. One last video. It, it must feel, it must feel so lonely. Because no one else does get it. It's not the normative experience most people have had. Right. Yeah. And I mean, that's why I do the work I do. And, we, mm -hmm. you know, I've started this nonprofit to be able to have, you know, we have discussion groups for survivors. Um, we have them for regular, I call regular <laughs> survivors mm -hmm. of uh, cults or narcissistic relationships, trauma, and then also uh, groups for people who are born or raised in a cult. Um, and uh, people get so much out of those groups, like mm -hmm. just being able to spend an hour and a half with other people who know what you're talking about, right? And you don't have to explain yourself and you mm -hmm. don't have to apologize. Mm -hmm. um, it's so powerful. And we certainly need more resources in our society and especially for people who are born and raised in a cult. As you know, Mm -hmm. So there you have it. This place is a very lonely place coming out of a cult. And me and Nikita mentioned this in our very first video that one of the reasons we even came out on YouTube was because we understood how lucky we were to be able to heal and come out of this closed system with a group of friends that we could lock arms with and support each other. So many people don't have that. We said to each other repeatedly, can you imagine going through this? Can you imagine going through this pain by yourself? And that's actually what happened. I, I mentioned this earlier, but I reached out to friends, especially a really close friend who I always thought about while I was still in the church. And I immediately reached out and, and just groveled pretty much that I am so sorry that you were right. I am so sorry. And one of the things this person said to me is, thank you so much. I really feel like God had you reach out to me at the right time because life has, has just been impacted by that time ever since I left, which was over 10 years ago for this person. And they said, I knew something happened to me. I knew something happened to me and I could not put my finger on it. And I thought, how many more people are just like this? And you people who are like, get over it, you don't know what these videos are doing to help people. You don't see the DMs we're getting, the calls we're getting of people who finally feel 
like they are not crazy, that they are able to start piecing their life back together because they are able to see what happened to them. When we share our stories, that shame, that self-rejection, that lack of forgiveness for yourself, when people share these stories, it gets washed away. When you're telling someone to get over it, move past it, just forgive, you're asking them to take their pain, stuff it, and hide it, and you are actually helping to harm that person. So anyway, I could go on and on about that, but one of the things I want to say is that you are not crazy, something happened to you, and you are not alone, and we will continue to make content, but this content is for anyone who feels really, really confused about why talk about this. (laughs) Because it's healing what your church was supposed to do but didn't. All right. Thank you so much for joining the Culture Community Podcast, this video with me, Asha Glenn. I hope you stay tuned for more videos coming in the future. I look forward to seeing your comments. Make sure to like and subscribe. I took that from other people. Um, If you felt this video was helpful to you, and thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for spending this time with me. And um, you are amazing. You deserve respect. You deserve love. You deserve to have autonomy over your life. Please do not join a cult. Please believe that God loves you and no person can dictate how that works and what that looks like for you. And I just really wish you the best. I hope you have the best life. All right. Bye.